I'm Nicola Talent and you're watching Crime World, a podcast about criminals, drugs and the underworld in Ireland and across the globe. Make sure you subscribe to our channel and turn on notifications so you can be the first to watch all our latest episodes. You can also listen wherever you get your podcasts. Pale blue eyes followed the girl in the mirror as she chatted to her customer. Larry Murphy was watching the way she moved as she leaned over. In his twisted mind, he fantasised that he knew what she really wanted. When the girl turned and challenged him with a stare, he lowered his eyes quickly. He let them slide down her legs to her boots as she went back to work. Larry sneered. He knew her sort, the type who thought they were too good for grafters like him because there was sawdust in his clothes and his hands smelt of terps. She smiled and chatted to customers. His eyes crept up to her face again. He wanted her to see him this time. She threw a worried glance in his direction. Good. Now she was starting to sense what was coming. He wanted her scared. It was part of the turn on. She sashayed over to the till, heels clicking along the tiles. The other guy's hard-earned cash ching-chinging into her cash register. She was cockier than he thought, really fancied herself this one. She thought she was something special. Not for long. He was going to take her down a peg or two. No better man. Not here, not yet. But when she found out what he'd in store for her, she'd end up begging him for more. They always did. Deep down, all women wanted a bit of rough. That Larry could do. Once she found out how good he was, she'd fall in love with him. They always did. Not that anything could come of it. He was spoken for, a family man. His wife was salt of the earth, so the good in everyone, even him. But Larry didn't want good. He didn't want someone who wanted him. He wanted a fight. If she was a good girl, he'd bring her somewhere special. Make it the night of her life. As the other customer left, Larry jolted up and out of the seat and strode out before she had time to turn her attentions to him. There'd be plenty of time later. He hung around for a while outside to make sure she didn't go anywhere. Waiting. Watching. Nothing was going to stand in his way. His name still strikes fear across Ireland. A hunter who stalked his prey in the heart of the area known as the Vanishing Triangle. But where is Larry Murphy now? And why is he a suspect in the murder of teenager Deirdre Jacob and the mystery disappearance of Jojo Dullard and Annie McCarrick? Now, in a Crime World mini-series, we present Predator, Larry Murphy and Ireland's Missing Women, a chilling true crime special. This is Crime World, a podcast from sundayworld.com. The man pacing up and down the car park was around six foot with strawberry blonde hair a round face and sickly white skin. It was dark, after eight in the evening in February, but Jill, not her real name, could just make him out under a streetlight. He looked to be mid-thirties, with his hands stuffed in a pair of scruffy jeans and a, a dark fleece zipped up to the neck. The hairs on the back of her neck bristled. He was standing about 20 feet away from her car, with the fidgety edge of someone grown impatient waiting. Jill drew a deep breath. She was 28, had looks, brains, a steady boyfriend, her own place and her own business. She wasn't physically frail or easily phased. She waited up. Men didn't normally hang around here like that, but she wanted to go home. It had been a long day at work and she'd spent it on her feet, Hers wasn't the only car left. 
This was Carlo, not Compton. Tightening her grip on her black handbag containing the day's takings, she hurried across the tarmac, clicked the central locking and tugged the handle. Suddenly, he started towards her. Give me the money. She pulled the door open quickly. His fist rose. With a crack, warm blood trickled down her face. Help! A second punch came smashing into her face and made her legs go from under her. With a hard shove, he pushed her onto the driver's seat. Jill lurched back up to grab the handle, trying to pull the door closed. But he leaned between her and the door, gripping his fingers around her throat. Move over. His lashless eyes were full of hate. Jill scrambled backwards over to the passenger seat with a wail, frantically scanning the car park for any signs of life. But there was no one. She wailed. He was in the driver's seat, had pulled the door closed behind him before she'd a chance to turn for the passenger handle. His left arm stretched across and grabbed her by the hair. Please! He slammed her head sideways, cracking her cheekbone off the metal handbrake. Please! Where are the keys? She didn't know. Help! Her hands flapped, tried to reach for his grip to loosen it. The keys! If she dropped them, he'd have to get out again. If he got out again, she could grab the passenger handle. With a sudden whoop of delight, he spotted them glinting on the floor under her boots. And he leaned sideways to grab them, ramming them in the ignition. Jill started to scream. He could have the car. He could have the money. He jerked her quiet with juts of his left elbow to her face and tugs of the scalp. Please. After giving the car park the once over, he gunned the engine, put the car in gear, revved it a few times and took off. He was really good at this. Strip. Larry Murphy swerved to a parking bay 25 yards away, pulling up at a secluded point in the car park alongside a block of flats. Take your bra off. He'd parked his date's car beside a 97 Kildare registered blue Fiat Punto hatchback, his own, that was facing out onto the roadway. She was hysterical, not Miss High and Mighty Businesswoman anymore. Didn't look so good either. Her face was a mess, hair stuck to tears, snot and blood. She was begging him to let her go. As she reached around her back for her bra strap, Larry was already aroused. He yanked the bra off her, clamped his wrists together with one hand and jerked it around them, knotting it so tight that her hands turned puffy. No bitch was going to decide if he was or wasn't her type or treat him like he wasn't good enough tonight. Everything that happened from this point on was down to him. Give me the money. Relief spread across her face. She thought that's what this was about. She tried to twist around and stretch between the seats for her bag where it had landed, fretting again when she couldn't reach it, panting because her hands were... they were useless. I can't do it. Such a drama queen. He leaned to the back seat and rifled two money bags out of the top of her bag and took them in his pocket. She was sobbing through her tears to please let her go. She didn't get it at all. He didn't need her money. He didn't want her money. He was in charge. That was all. Without him, she had nothing. And she was nothing. No car, no money, no say, no life. The sound of her whimpering was getting on his wick. Someone might hear when he got out of the car. He looked around for something to use, then ripped a red, green and yellow Carlo GAA headband dangling from her rearview mirror. He positioned it over her mouth, tying it tight enough against the corners to push her tongue to the back of her throat. He was a Wicklow supporter himself. She moaned through the gag to be let go. More games. She might as well just relax and enjoy it. She'd be pleading for more by the time he was finished with her, but a relationship was out of the question. He'd a family responsibilities. Take off your boots. She leaned forward, but her hands were bound so tight she couldn't get out the zips, more begging in between that dull, low-pitched moan of fear turning him on. He leaned across and scooped the boots off, dropping them in under the footwell. Her eyes bulged in terror. Good. She was starting to understand. 
Opening the driver's door, he climbed out, checking over his shoulders that the coast was clear before pacing over to the Fiat. He caught the look in her eyes, trained on him as he walked. It was like hope. She thought it was ending. He pulled the boot of his car open at nil points it had only just begun. Her face began to contort again on the other side of the glass as he headed back in her direction, swung open the passenger door. She was kicking so much he had to drag her out, more moaning, thrashing, bucking. She was putting up quite a fight. Gripping her at the back of the neck with one hand, he kept the other flat on her back as he directed her towards the Fiat boot. He guided her head in and the rest followed with a hard knock. Slamming the boot shut, he headed back to the driver's seat and had one more scope that no one was around. Satisfied, he drove off. He decided to take her somewhere special, to a place that meant a lot to him. Beaconstown, nine miles away. The disco, in the grounds of the medieval Kilkey Castle, was his old stomping ground. He used to go there all the time. Couples travelled from all over the world to get married there. Personally, he remembered it as somewhere he'd been ritually humiliated by women, who turned him down because he wasn't good enough. At least until he met his wife. His wife. She didn't look like the other woman. Her hair was short, and she didn't wear makeup. They'd been married six years, since 1994. Tonight, he was going to take his bit on the side down memory lane, to some farmland where you went for a court if you scored at the disco. It was near his wife's home place, and that filled him with nostalgia. He turned the radio up to full volume to drown out the racket coming from the boot. He'd one stop to make on the way, business before pleasure, always. His own trade was carpentry, but he'd a lucrative little sideline going clearing sites for new buildings, digging foundations and holes for septic tanks. On the Hackettstown Road, he pulled up at a pebble-dashed bungalow to pay off one of the lads he'd subcontracted. He'd been working another job all day and he wanted to fix up with the lad he owed. The Fiat was practically thumping with the sound of the radio as he climbed out and paid the man. Larry used his own money. The worker looked over Larry's shoulder as he climbed back into the car. Now, it was just the two of them again. Curled up in the fetal position with her wrists bound, Jill couldn't protect herself from the metal tools bouncing around the boot as the car sped. She tried to concentrate on breathing in and out so she wouldn't let herself start to think. The smell of oil and a rubber football were suffocating. There was a coppery taste of blood in the back of her mouth, but she couldn't swallow properly with the gag. He'd broken her nose so the air wasn't travelling in that way either. If she could just free her hands and pull the gag down. But it was useless. Her hands were tied too tight. She couldn't even feel them anymore. The pain was irrelevant. Her whole body shook with fear. If he could do this to her, punch her in the face, abduct her from a public place, stuff her into the boot of a car, somewhere you wouldn't put a dog, what was he planning next? Where was he taking her? Was he going to let her live to tell people about this? She kept stopping her head from going there. If she vomited, she'd choke. She tried to focus on which way he was going, picturing the road he must be on by the direction the car turned. A long straight drive first on a main road. She could kind of tell by the speed and the sound of the other cars whizzing by. She thought they were on the Hackettstown Road, but there was too many twists and turns on country roads and she just lost track. She started struggling for breath again. If he was taking her to the middle of nowhere, there could be only one reason why. After about 25 minutes, the road surface changed again. She listened to the tyres crunching on gravel. He'd slowed to a crawl, and then the car came to a stop. He'd stopped once earlier, but nothing had happened. This time it was different. He'd kill the radio. She strained to listen over the sound of her breath getting shorter. That metal clang was a front seat being lowered back. Then a door opened. Now footsteps. The boot clicked open. 
Larry pulled his fancy woman out of the boot. She looked a state as her bare feet landed in the boreen and she stood upright. Blood had congealed in her nostrils and on the front of her teeth. Her eyelids were a shade between sort of brown and purple. She turned her head from side to side, searching the dark fields for anything or anyone. She'd underestimated him. He began to undress her. She was trembling so much, he wanted her more than ever. Finally, he had some respect. He led her around to the door where the seat was lying back in wait. Get in. He pulled the gag off her mouth. Please, will you take me home after? Her voice was so hoarse it was a whisper. Kiss me, he said. Jill lay underneath the man, frozen with dread. She thought of all the people she loved, who didn't know where she was. She should be home now. They'd start to worry soon. Tears streamed down her face. She could see a child's seat in the back of the car. This was a family car? There'd be all kinds of proof in the car that she'd been here. Hairs, fibres, bodily fluids. He's never going to let her go. If he could do this to her, he could do anything. She cried. She knew he was going to kill her. A grunt. And then he was still. This is it. Her eyes were glued to him as he climbed out of the car. As he zipped himself up. Please take me home now, please. Are you married? His rage had evaporated. He was acting like he didn't have a care in the world. And his voice even sounded chirpy. Like like he wanted to make conversation, like, like this was a casual fling. Yes, Jill lied. If he thought she'd a husband, maybe he'd think somebody was out looking for her. It felt safer. Please take me home. He might as well not have heard. He wanted to talk about himself. He was a married man, he said, sounding apologetic. He'd two sons aged four and two, a wife pregnant with their third. Jill felt the life drain out of her. He was telling her things that would make him identifiable if he let her go. She held up her hands. They sort of turned blue. Please, the pain, it hurts so much, please. He shot her a sheepish look like she could wrap him around her little finger and then he made a great play out of opening the knot and securing them again behind her back, this time using the headband to tie them. Another mood shift. Back in the boot. Please, no, not back there. You said you'd take me home, please. You'll make too much noise. I'll be quiet. Please, please take me home. Please. He shook his head, then tied her bra around her mouth. Jill got into the boot. Naked this time. Larry set off on the 14-mile journey home to Bolton Glass in County Wicklow, turning onto the Dublin Carlow Road after three and a half miles and then crossing in the direction of the Glen of Amal and the Blessington to Bolton Glass Road. His mind was all over the place. He tried to explain to his new girlfriend that he was married with children so she'd understand what he had to do next, but he knew she just didn't get it. His foot pumped the accelerator. As much as he'd like to see her again, she could make life very difficult for him. Women were lying bitches and hell hath no fury. He couldn't take the risk. It wouldn't be fair on his wife to put her through any more, certainly not in her condition. There was no other way he'd have to get rid of the girl. He'd bring her somewhere close to remember how things had been between them. But he'd give her the time of her life before that, he thought. That was the least he could do. Twenty minutes later, the car slowed to a snail's pace and began to climb a hill. Jill could hear water. Was he going to drown her? Would he let the car roll back down into a river? Would the people she loved spend the rest of their lives wondering why she hadn't come home, if she'd ever come through the door again? She kept squirming her hands against the bind. The car stopped. And she stopped breathing, trying to hear. 
What was he doing with the handbrake? Her heart was thudding too loud and she couldn't tell. She kept pulling at her wrists. The boot clicked open. He hauled her out again. Jill looked around frantically. A wood this time, but there was a light in the distance, a house. He led her back to the front of the car, indicated the passenger seat, pulled the gag down, took the bind off her hands and lay down. Make love to me. Please, will you bring me home, please? I will. Jill had been numbed to the pain, but now there was no keeping it from breaking through. He raped her, orally and anally. It didn't feel like her body anymore. It felt like his toilet. She couldn't take any more. If you've a gun, use it now because I can't take any more. The words were out before she could take them back, but they had the opposite effect. It was like she'd flicked a switch. He started to feel sorry for himself. One of them had to be the victim. I'll never see my wife and children again. Jill felt a glimmer of hope, but within seconds he talked himself back up. His name was Michael, and he was from Boltonglass. Her blood ran cold. These were details that if he let her go would lead back to him. Ca- can I have a cigarette, Michael? If she could get the bind off her hands. He switched the overhead light on. She looked up, straight into his plain, boyish face. Milky blue eyes locked on hers. Back in the boot, put your clothes on first. Jill became hysterical. He dragged her out, pulled her trousers on and led her back around. She climbed in backwards. This is it. He's going to kill me. Then one of the hands she'd been pulling slipped free of the tie. Jill couldn't believe it. She pulled the brow off her mouth. If she could grip one of the metal tools, she could try to hit him when he came back. Suddenly the boot clicked open. She froze. She hadn't found anything. Had he seen her moving? Turn around, he told her. He wanted her to face in rather than out. He started pushing her to turn around. Her hand found a bottle of pledge polish. She raised her arm, pointed at his face and pressed the nozzle. Silence. Nothing happened. The spray didn't work. He was furious. He punched it out of her hand and slammed the boot shut. And then nothing. Jill crouched, trying to hear over the thud of her heart, but nothing. No engine revving, no car starting. The boot clicked open. He burst in with the plastic bag and put it over her head. The stink of fumes was overpowering. She tore it off, legs flailing to get out. He stuffed the plastic in her mouth, pulled the bra that he'd slipped around her neck tighter. The smell of chemicals off the plastic made her head light and she couldn't breathe. With the last kick, her feet somehow landed on the ground. Air flooded back into her lungs. He'd let go of her neck. Her vision was dazzled by blinding lights. She covered her eyes, coughing for air. She could hear him slamming the car door. Jill collapsed on both knees and crawled for her life. A ditch of barbed wire stopped Jill in her tracks. The more she moved, the more the spikes tore into her flesh. There was so much blood, but she knew he was gone. She'd seen him over her shoulder as she ran. He'd U-turned the Fiat. The tyres screeched as he'd sped away. But now there was another car, a jeep, the one that had shone the lights. Two more men were coming. She clamped her jaw to stop her teeth chattering and tried to push on past the wire. If she could just get to the house with the light. Are you all right? A man's voice in the dark. Jill wailed. They were getting closer. She put her hands over her mouth so they wouldn't hear and she crouched down into the ditch. Are you okay? Another voice called. Are you all right? She tried to bolt, but the metal was carving into her. She couldn't get out. We want to help you. Are you okay? Sobs heaved through her body. She was trapped. We, we'll take you wherever you want to go. Are, are you with him? Jill shouted. No, he's gone, the first one answered. I'm going to get a torch, the other said. He was running back towards the jeep. Is he with him? 
she shouted, panic-stricken. No, we're going to help you, the first one said. They'd been out lamping foxes, he explained. The lights stun the animals, make them easier to hunt. And that's how they'd spotted her. Her legs were sticking out of the car boot. It was chance they were here. They wanted to help, not hurt her. The other man was back. He shone the torch in Jill's direction. And she saw the horror in their faces as they glanced at each other. She let them close the gap to her. Did he hurt you? The first one asked. He raped me, she bawled. Only for you he was going to kill me. He'd a plastic bag over my head. The men picked the metal spikes out of deep, bloody cuts. She'd need stitches and she was, she was cold as stone, shaking convulsively. Inside the jeep there were rifles with telescopic sights and powerful lamps. Their names were Trevor and Ken. And she was going to be all right, they told her. They needed to go to a guard station. Trevor looked to Ken and Ken gave a quick nod of approval. We know who he is, Trevor said. Larry couldn't go home now. His house in Woodfield was three miles from here. A left at Kilranlala B&B at the bottom of Spinnin' Wood, where she'd escaped, and a left again would have brought him straight to his door, just like he'd planned. It was after ten, but he, he just couldn't go home yet, not until he'd time to think. What were the chances of anyone coming up that road in daylight, let alone at night? He drove to the place where he'd grown up, Stratford on Slaney, less than four miles away. There were only 150 odd people living in the village and he'd been one of seven kids, had taken up carpentry as a trade, just like his father. He headed for the only pub in the village, the Stratford Arms. He needed a drink. If the men in the jeep had got his reg, he was fucked. If they hadn't got his reg, she knew enough about him to bring the guardie to his door. He'd said he lived in Baltonglass and named his kids. If they'd put him in a lineup, he'd be identified. His DNA would match anything they'd recovered. He ordered a bottle of whiskey. He needed to get his story straight in his head. Once that was done, he'd hit the road. The jeep sped to Bolton Glass Garda Station in around 10 minutes. It had been four years previous, Trevor recalled. A female acquaintance of his was in the Donard Arms, a pub in the Glen of Amal village at the edge of the Wicklow Mountains. This man kept staring at her in a freaky kind of pervy way. Next thing he just leapt at her and groped her. The guy actually sexually assaulted her in a public place where people knew who he was. He'd had to be pulled off her. His name was Larry Murphy. Trevor wasn't in the pub at the time, but the woman had pointed the man out at a later stage. She hadn't wanted to go to the Gardaí, but Trevor had never forgotten his face, nor his name. That was the man who just attacked Jill. It was the same man. Ken knew Larry Murphy too. Murphy was a carpenter with a brother in the same trade. He'd a reputation for having a terrible temper. You couldn't haggle a price with him or he'd lose it. It was Larry Murphy who'd raped and tried to kill her, all right. They were both sure of that. His wife was waiting in the kitchen when Larry got home. She was nearing the end of her pregnancy and had spent the day looking after her two young boys. Their house was a dormer bungalow with a separate garage, three miles outside Bolton Glass on the Bowley Road. He was well oiled and had kept drinking the whiskey by the neck on the drive home. Larry walked her down the corridor to their bedroom at the end of the hall. He took off all his clothes, climbed into bed and had sex with his wife. 